Diana Rigg was the ideal interviewee in that she was frank, quick-witted and funny. And she always looked as if she enjoyed being asked questions, no matter how daft they might be. Or perhaps she was just demonstrating her talents as an actress. There have been few with her range, everything from Emma Peel to Mother Courage. The first time we met was in 1972. I did not tell me notes down. <laughs> I didn't realise, in, in fact, until uh, oh, a long time ago when I went to a rugby league match in Yorkshire where I saw you. It was the first time I ever saw you apart from on the screen. But in fact, you were a Yorkshire girl. Yes, I, that was the occasion when I went home and it was sort of local girl made good. Yeah. And it was smashing. Yeah. They all said, you know, hello, Diane. I haven't changed, have you? <laughs> <laughs> but you have, of course. What? You have, of course. I don't, uh, no, I don't think basically, no. no. I, I mean, I have many more accessories. I mean, I suppose I've got more money and more things, but the qualities that existed as a Yorkshire girl are still there. Mm. What are they? What are the particular qualities, do you think, that uh, that part of the country gives you? Um, it's a sense of reality, I think, more than anything else. Uh, the, awareness that even though you may be a success there's that yorkshire voice at the back of your mind which is saying aye but no but just <laughs> <laughs> you've still got to keep working at it you yeah. know um what kind of um i mean from kind of the background that you did up there which i i know i know very well being i was born so very near you um it always struck me that um if i'd have ever said that i wanted to go into the theater that my dad would have thought he spawned a wrong <laughs> <You know. laughs> um, did you have something of this parental opposition to your ambitions to uh, to being a an actress? Not too much. I mean, uh, parents, they love you very much. And if they think you want to do something like crazy, like being an actress, then they're behind you. But there's always a reason. They always, um, in, in some sense, rationalize it. And I heard my mother's rationalization only last week. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, well, of course. She said, somewhere, some time ago, she said, one of your forebears was illegitimate. <laughs> And that seems to explain the fact that I became an actress. <laughs> it's very curious how people associate sort of so-called loose morality and, and the theatre, Absolutely, theater, isn't it? Yes, yes, yeah. And has it been your experience in the theatre that, in fact, that this is a lie or, or a truth? Oh, I think it's, I think it's a lie. Um, the days of the casting couch, if they ever did exist, I think they must have been very much exaggerated because nobody's asked me to take off my clothes for a part. <laughs> I mean, I don't know whether to take that as a sort of knock or, or what, but they, they haven't. The thing, of course, that, that made you, um, uh, gave you all this sort of fame was, was the Avengers thing, wasn't it? Undoubtedly, it did an mm. awful lot for you. How did you get that part as, as Emma Peel? Because I must say that um, if one followed it from the beginning and took on a black man as being the kind of uh, creature that you imagine in the part, you were the, the last person actually to follow on. Hmm. Mm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Shall we talk about something else? Well, no, no, no. Um, I hadn't seen Honor on the, on the telly, because I'd, I'd been doing theatre all the time. And, and I turned up uh, the studios to do a test, along with 500 other ladies all dressed in basic black trousers and um, a sweater. And I did my test with Patrick, who... who um, and one stuntman, who, uh, all of us had to go through the same ritual. We had to play a scene with Patrick, and then we had to do a fight with the stuntman. And this stuntman was clouted over the head with a handbag 500 times. <laughs> <laughs> and when it got to uh, my turn, I mean, he was absolutely punch drunk and fell to the floor. And they obviously thought, well, she's the strongest and gave me the part. <laughs> how, how did men react to you uh, being Emma Peel? Did you, did you find that their reaction to you was different than when you were just dying a rig before it all happened? Yes. Yes, it's, yeah. <laughs> socially it can be terribly difficult. Really? Well, they think you're infallible, I and mean, they think you're this sort of great butch creature, you know, <laughs> which I'm not um, either. <laughs> and uh, I, neither am I going to, to 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 work my head off to try and sort of uh, dissolve that whole image, you know. Mm. I expect people to, to accept me as I am, that's all. Mm. A lot of people who appear in, in a series as successful as that find that their career ends there, don't they? I yes. Mean, if you look at some of the people who've been on Coronation Street, for mm. instance, this sort of thing. Mm. You obviously didn't have this problem. I didn't have it because I refused to accept that it existed. I mean, I think it still exists in the minds of the people who maybe come to see the plays because they come to see me, the person who was Emma Peel. And if they buy the ticket to, to the show, that's fine by me because thereafter it's my business to make them believe that I'm 
an actress and I can do more than one thing. Mm. You're not married, are you, Diana? No. And you lived with a man for a long time. In fact, sort of before it became really respectable to, uh, to live with a fellow. Why, what appealed to you, in the, the option that you had of, of living with somebody as against marrying them? What was it? Uh, I, I refuse to talk in generalities because I, I, I don't want to affect other people. I reached this through a very personal process. And so it's a, it's a very personal decision. And I hate the idea of affecting anybody and yes. saying marriage is out and all that. I'm simply talking about myself. And that is um, not being married um, means that uh, I consciously commit myself on a daily basis to somebody. And I find, in fact, I'm much more faithful and much more loving and, and, and caring than I think if I were married. I don't know because I've never been married, but I prefer to, to, to keep trying. Does the resolve ever weaken, though? Do you ever, are there moments when you ever feel the need of permanent companionship, if you could describe marriage as being that? You can have permanent companionship outside marriage. Uh, I think the mistake is, is to think that, that there are, I mean, I, I don't want to dictate to people. Uh, you, you, living outside marriage with somebody can be a marriage, but simply without the ceremony, mm. that's all. Can I talk to you about something else which has uh, uh, briefly affected your life, um, about nudity on the stage? Oh, God. Well, I think it's a very fascinating area. Um, <laughs> do you, I mean, you, you, you've, you've taken your clothes off on stage. I take my clothes off on stage. Yes. Do you have to talk yourself into it? Yes. I come from Yorkshire. <laughs> Nobody takes their clothes off in Yorkshire except on a Friday night. I mean. <laughs> well, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday and Sunday, I had to talk myself into it, you know. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was difficult. Yes, uh, how do you finally justify it in the end, Lena? Because it seems to me that the... the, the quotes that you see from people that uh, in the end it was justifiable because of the of the the structure of the play is um doesn't it seem to hold yes it's a bit facile it's i bit did facile. it too i yes. mean i must admit that yes. those are the very things that i said yes. however because i was talking to the national newspapers at the time and because they only had about three lines in which to quote me i i didn't see any point in talking about what i really thought was the issue and that is that we all have breasts and we all have penises and we all have bodies in common and that is not the most precious thing that we possess the most precious thing that we possess are our personalities and our spirits and i think that um from the victorian era onwards too much emphasis has been placed on covering your body um i think to trust each other and to love each other sufficiently to show our spirits is infinitely more important. Mm. Can I ask you why um, you, in fact, turned down the offer that Playboy made you to, to, mm. to pose nude? Um, I, it's not my reply. It's somebody else's, which I cared to quote at that time, and which is, I don't want a navel stapled. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, nipples always tend to be slightly purple in Playboy. <laughs> 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 Well, some people might have purple nipples. Yes, they might, but not everybody. No. You know. <laughs> what about pictures of, of um, I mean, now that have this sort of thing recently with Cosmopolitan opening up here of male nudity. Does, does the, 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 the picture of a, a male nude turn you on particularly? No. Yeah. But, I mean, nudes don't turn me on. I don't turn myself on nude, and I very much hope that I didn't turn other people on nude. In fact, when I was doing uh, Abelard and Eloise, I think it was in the provinces in Newcastle, it was from a post office worker, uh, I know, because it was written on a telegram form, <laughs> and he said, I don't know why you bother. My girlfriend's tits are much larger than yours. <laughs> Although that, that, you know, that was a bit of a put-down, it made my point. Yes. <laughs> Diana Rigg once told me she'd very much like to appear on the show with Malcolm Muggeridge, so we fixed it. She said she admired Malcolm without agreeing with everything he said, and so it proved on the show. 
I saw your eyes widen, glint there, when Malcolm made the remark there about sex, or the, the, the purpose of sex. Appropriation of love, it's condition. Yes. yes. That well, is, that's not something you would agree with, is it, Diamond? Yes, it is. Malcolm, no. Really? I'm what afraid What do you think not. its purpose is? Infinite joy. Unrelated to, unrelated to anything else. No, related to the person that you love. But that is the condition. That's what I said. But I don't happen to be a rubber freak. I don't happen to be a Didn't sadist or a masochist. No, I'm, cle <laughs> I'm clearing the air between telling yes. you I am not. Yes, right? I'm, I'm very pleased to hear. I, it. Surely. <laughs> However, were I, or even to be homosexual. I would find your dismissal of something that I needed as much as I needed food um, not charitable. I said its purpose is procreation, and of course, if that purpose is clear, then it's it's it, then 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 it it, it 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 is a very wonderful thing. But if you divorce it from that. Then you create horror. I, okay. I'm absolutely convinced. What you're saying is that, that if, if Diana and I had met a long, long time ago and, and, and fallen for each other and, and, and made love not necessarily married, but made love to satisfy our own bodies, our own mm. desires, mm. that that, in your view, is wrong? And that is I think it's something that, that, that is very inferior. And what's more, I think that you yourselves will come to see that. You think that when I'm your age, Mark, which is 73, that I shall be... I don't know I what you'll be saying, Mike, conclusion. but that won't, yeah. whatever conclusion you come to won't be because you're 73. It'll be because you've understood, you've understood uh, what these impulses are about, and you can separate out from them something which is very trivial and ultimately demeaning and selfish do, from its tr true purpose. And uh, you would agree with that? Do, 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 yes, you, no, she's... Fine, I'm going to ask you, Di, if, if, if uh, she, as she matures, might come to this... And she this knows she, I was... I'm uh, sure I will, because uh, um, I, I can't wait to be old and, and gentle and uh, retrospective and utterly past it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be so sure about that. Diana Rigg was made a dame in 1994 for her services to the theatre. There ought to have been another award for her services to the talk show. She was somewhere near the top of the list of the guest I most enjoyed talking to. The thing about her was she could make small talk, baby talk even. Fascinating. Since last I, I, I met you, which was four years ago, I think you were on the show, mm. um, a lot's happened to you. One of the main things that happened to you, you had a baby. I had a baby. Yes. Uh, <laughs> now, now how, was, um, how was motherhood? Uh, how have you taken to it? Well, I've taken to it rather well, actually. I didn't think I would. Uh, my pregnancy was just wonderful. And for any aged ladies, because, I mean, over the age of 25, they call you elderly. You were 39, I thought, when you were I was 38. 38. 38. Yes, 38. 38. And you walk in and you say, Doctor, I'm pregnant. He says, you're, you're elderly, he says. So that's terrific news, you know. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, had a, I had a wonderful time. And I, I drank champagne from mm. the morning till night. I couldn't have been healthier. And uh, came the baby, and it's just the most joyous thing in the world. The first time I pushed her out in the street, pram, deep pride, here she is. And a man walking along the street, and he recognized me, and he burst out laughing. It was the pro I mean, just me and a pram seemed to him utterly wrong. <laughs> and I was so cross. Here I was playing the mother as well yeah. as I possibly could. But is it difficult, though, I mean, being recognised, being who you are, being a normal mum? And how normal a mum are you? I mean, do you go to nursery with a Oh, kid yes, I go. I go to... There's a wonderful place near, near me, run by the, the, the uh, Kensington Chelsea Council, where you take your child from 1 o'clock in the morning until, until uh, 4.30. And all the uh, things are there, water and collage and painting and everything. And I actually, I get a bit uh, daunted by those professional mothers that are there. You know, those Guardian Women's Page mothers. <laughs> and I read my Guardian Women's Page, and I, I, I admire what they do. But, mm. you know, there they are in the middle of January with no stockings on their feet and, and, and open-toed sandals and out pops a breast and they <laughs> feed the baby. <laughs> and I feel that I'm sort of not, uh, not quite in there with it. Do you compare sort of, uh, I suppose, children, behaviour? Oh, absolutely, you know, yes. Uh, as yours let you down, you have to go oh, totally. bad, bad habits. Oh, that, terrible, terrible. Like what? 
Well, she discovered nose picking. <laughs> and uh, I've been and making orchard. I've been making a living here at Grayson. Okay. If you had me as a mother, you'd carry on because oh. you, get, you just get so tired of saying, you know, Rachel, don't pick your nose. <laughs> and I was pushing her through a, a London store, a uh, pretty kind of sort of high class London store, and she was terribly quiet in her pram, and I knew exactly that one finger was lost up one nostril. <laughs> uh, but I decided not to say, Rachel, don't pick your nose for the 50th time that day. And there was a long pause, and suddenly a little triumphant voice said, Bogey! <laughs> They have great natural timing, don't they? Oh, absolutely wonderful. They really do. Yeah. Uh, also, you've gone into, into hot water recently when you revealed in a, in a newspaper article that, um, that you're in the habit of biting your baby's bum. Yes. Right? Um, first of all, why? Oh, I can't resist. Really? I mean, oh, it's there. <laughs> yeah, and my poor daughter, I said to, to her, Rachel, come here, I have to bite your bottom. And she's now two and three quarters, so she's, oh, Christ, oh, <laughs> goes backwards and takes her knickers down and waits for this nutter to do what it has to do with the background. But you know, I mean, the skin, the flesh, you just have to sink your teeth into it. <laughs> I mean, you know, I've got letters from... <laughs> and I've, I've got letters from women saying, oh, how dare you, how dare you bring sex, filthy sex oh. into your child. I don't care. <laughs> Not only my child, I'll bite anybody else. <laughs> Have you ever had your bum bitten? Do you know, I don't think I did. I think that's what I missed. Really? Yeah. I don't think my mother or my father bit my, my baby's bottom. But, I mean, if I, you know, Rachel's chums, if there's a bare bottom going in, it's got my teeth in it sooner or later. Because your, 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 your bottom gained some notoriety, did it not? Uh, uh, some time ago, when you did uh, Tom Stoppard's play, was it Jumpers, wasn't yes, it? Yes, yes. You had to reveal your bottom. I had to bear my bottom. You had, yes. Yeah, it wasn't just one of these cases where the director thought it would be good for the play. It was actually in the text, you know, I had to do it. And so I, I mean, the only way I could do it, I mean, I, I made it up. Night after night, I used to put three layers of dark Egyptian <laughs> on my bum. I mean, because otherwise it just looked like a piece of old cod. <laughs> <laughs> what bottoms do? I mean, you know. Do you actually have fun on stage? Oh, yes. Do you? Oh, what? yes. I believe in it. What do you do? Oh, naughtiness. Like what? <laughs> well, uh, no, for the most part, you, 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 I, I just love doing it. But, I mean, there are occasions when it becomes... Mm, and uh, I think the, part, the thing that Dennis was talking about was in Macbeth, which is a, a very difficult play. First of all, I've actually never seen a production that works totally. Because of the witches and the drama of it all, and I discovered that Lady Macbeth was a great ball to do, yes. actually. And um, at one point, the director had Dennis Quilly sliding his hand down the front of my bodice and massaging a breast. And... It was a matinee, it must have been. <laughs> and I muttered to him under my breath, down a bit, left a bit, right a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Golden shot. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to it? Did it collapse? Well, it collapsed, because Dennis giggles a great deal too, yes. thank God. Yes. You've, in fact, also, I mean, throughout your career, you've been more or less universally acclaimed by the critics, haven't you? Certainly in... Yeah, touching in, wood. In, in, ...in recent years. What was the worst thing that's been said about you, though? Oh, yes, I can remember. Really? Because I think every actor who's truly honest remembers their worst notice. Because it actually carves itself on your soul. You live with it for, for, for weeks before you finally exercise the pain of it. And this was a, a gentleman in New York writing about the nude scene in Abelard and Eloise. And he said, Diana Rigg is built like a brick mausoleum with insufficient flying buttresses. <laughs> Live with that one, too. <laughs> what on earth? Doing a nude scene once more. And what's in the pipeline for the immediate future? No, I really don't know. You know, I'm sort of... I've, I'm not on that treadmill anymore. I used to be. And I quite like being at home and biting my daughter's bottom. <laughs> you invite me around the next time you do it. <laughs> Diana Rigg, for the moment, thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you. you.
I hope Diana Rigg will not take it amiss when I say that when it comes to favourite guests, it was a toss-up between her and Miss 